All right, then let's get started. Uh, I will briefly introduce myself, get, getting rid of this right away. I'm an Earthling. What you may uh, discover from my accent that I'm French, but um, also I have the ambition to write an operating system on my own, which is what drove me to NetBSD actually, because it's an excellent way to learn how to do it. And I use it also as a base for my current work, which I put under the umbrella of uh, D4OS, like here, this, this project that I've been running since 2004. Uh, most of my, wor my work happens offline, uh, so I'm working mostly on NetBSD with Git instead of CVS, through the HBSD project, where I publish uh, all of my public repositories uh, and also welcome other contributors to participate. We have a small community since August 2013 over there, uh, which even brought some developers to the NetBSD project itself. All right, but now to what's uh, interesting to us right now. If you do not know about Package Source yet, this is the right place. It's a project managed by the NetBSD Foundation, as in here. Initially, the way to obtain third-party software for NetBSD, uh, since we insist on doing the right thing, we managed to get it to work across systems, so it's now portable and ported over 17 platforms now. Uh, package source itself is not the subject of this talk, but um, really my motivation to, to uh, work on this. I know I'm going to say cyber, but uh, there is a cyber war going on right now. I'm working on security because it's a hostile world out there, and I feel like I have to protect my systems. I do also this as a job, actually. But when it comes to the context of uh, package source, NetBSD, and distributing software, we have a responsibility towards our user because they rely on us for their daily operations. They need updates, for instance, security updates in particular. And this is also true for package source. We can probably even uh, go a bit farther and uh, be a bit preemptive about it, and this is where I chipped in. So uh, what can be done about this? Uh, in this talk, I will introduce uh, the security management that's already in place in package source. We have uh, different teams taking care of security. I will also speak about uh, technical measures that we can or uh, are applying now uh, for hardening the code base of your system and uh, future work, different perspectives for the improvements, what we can work on, and of course at the end Q&A if we have enough time. All right, so uh, now moving on to uh, security management. We have two options as um, uh, Cherry just mentioned, we can either panic or we can try to recover from critical situations. And in the case of NetBSD, we have two teams which help us recover. I will detail their roles. We have the security team and the release engineering group. Uh, hopefully we also have uh, some tools and also there are uh, specific uh, branches, releases that you can use as a user and that are expected to be stable and kept up to date regarding security. Um, so the security team in particular has uh, two duties, uh, two important duties. Uh, it handles security issues uh, regarding package source. There is an email address for that and a PGP key, uh, of course, for emailing them. And this team in particular maintains the vulnerability database, which can actually be updated by any NetBSD or package source developer but has to be signed and uploaded by the security team. Um, this database is assembled from different sources. Uh, we use release notes from upstream packages, of course, when they report security issues. There are also external vendors which uh, may report security uh, issues, threat visories. We used to depend on Secunia, but they uh, cut the feed for us, so unfortunately we have to use something else now. Of course, there are also public mailing lists uh, like OSS security or bug track and so on, full disclosure, where uh, security issues may be announced. So we have to keep an eye on that. And uh, also, we get errata or advisories from other distributions, governmental agencies, different certs, and so on. And as I just mentioned, there is a PGP key for you to report uh, security issues to us safely, confidentially. All right. Now, as a user, how do we um, make sure that the system is actually up to date regarding security using this, dis this database? Uh, you can have the system downloaded every day if you use NetBSD in particular. This is going to be done in daily.conf with this uh, variable fetch package vulnerabilities. 
For this, you need the system to run 24-7, uh, actually, because the cron job will be at some point in the day. Um, it's, uh, or you have to adapt the cron job to run when the system is up. Um, you can also fetch the database manually, if you prefer. Um, this is done with package admin. It's pretty much what the cron job does. Uh, do not forget the minus S sign there, because this is what actually will tell package admin to check the signature for the vulnerability database. And then if you want to use the vulnerability database to audit your system, there is a command for that, also through package admin, package admin audit. And there are also a list of different options. You can do this per package. You can even check uh, packages with versions which are not actually installed yet to check if, for instance, an update would actually fix an issue that you have. All right, so in practice, how does this look? What happens if you install a vulnerable package from source, for instance? Here I picked the Zen kernel um, in version 455 and installing it from source with make install. As you can see here, uh, we get a warning uh, after a check for vulnerabilities. More than a warning here, it's an error. Uh, the system is telling you, please change your uh, configuration files to allow this package specifically to be installed or generally uh, vulnerable packages to be installed. In the case of binaries, I picked uh, Wireshark in this case, which uh, on my system actually right now has an infinite loop vulnerability, for instance, in version 225. And in this case, you get a similar uh, message, which also comes from the vulnerability database. And package add will say uh, it, will, it was not able to uh, install a package because there is a known vulnerability. Uh, this can be tweaked, of course. Um, typically, in package install.conf, you would have check vulnerabilities uh, as always if you never want to install any package with known vulnerabilities. You can change it, however, for it to be a bit more convenient as a user, because there are still many vulnerabilities which are not fixed uh, for a number of packages, unfortunately. But at least they are known, and you can agree or not to have them on your system. So in the case of Wireshark here, um, I could simply say yes or no after uh, a list of known vulnerabilities to agree or not to install this package. So this is how this is configured, and i like to take this opportunity during this talk to thank the security team for maintaining this. Some of these members are uh, here, actually. Thank you, Seven, and uh, everybody else. Petra, no, Petra is in the other team. I'm not I will... in every group. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, I've seen you go so around uh, anyway. Uh, the other group, as we get to this, the release engineering group, which I will call uh, Relang here, it's easier to pronounce. It's also relevant for security, even if its job is actually to release, uh, to, to manage releases, sorry. Uh, so it manages the stable branches, but it also processes the pull-up requests. When uh, we have uh, changes we want to apply to stable releases, we have a process called pull-ups. And this is also relevant to security since some of these fixes actually imply security fixes. Um, there are uh, freezing periods in particular for package source every three months. The tree enters the, the freeze, in which case we proceed uh, not yet in pull-ups, but uh, we mostly focus on security fixes and build fixes, for instance. All right, so this is how the uh, pull-up request uh, list looked like as of yesterday. Uh, we have a couple issues open for a few weeks, but the rest is just a few days behind. Um, I see one here with Roundcube, uh, regular offender, unfortunately, but <laughs> this is not the topic today. Uh, but coming to stable releases, um, we have right now a freeze uh, on the 2017 Q3 branch meaning it's about to be released. We focus on security and build issues. Okay, there's no branch yet, but that's, that's the head basically, yeah. That's right. Uh, thanks, Penny. Uh, the latest table is still Q2, which accepts pull-up requests, and then Q1 is no longer maintained. Um, we do not offer long-term support in package source as a project itself. However, Joyant, a company using package source regularly, does it for its customers. Uh, they focus on SmartOS, which is uh, where they, uh, the, the service that they offer. Um, I, I think they also have uh, packages for macOS. I do not know if they have it for uh, maintained for LTS also, if they build it for LTS. But if you're interested 
in older uh, stable releases uh, for stability on your systems, for instance, if you do not want to upgrade every three months, you can use giant uh, source trees instead for package source, and they will be usually maintained for security. Then you can build your binaries from there. The Relang team is composed of a few uh, members, uh, Benny and Petra here. Um, so thank you also for, for your work. And uh, with this done, I would like to move on to the technical uh, aspect of uh, security in package source and how we are trying to improve the security level of the system as a whole, 17,000 packages at a time. So which tools do we have? Uh, we have a number of tools here already that I'm listing, package signatures, SSP, Fortify, StackCheck, Pi, and Railroad. I will go through them uh, one by one. Do not worry if you're not familiar with any one of them, I will try to uh, clarify this. So starting with package signatures, uh, I believe we were uh, in package source one of the first, if not the first uh, project to introduce this uh, support as a distribution. Uh, initially in 2001, which was already supporting two different mechanisms to implement that, either X5 and I certificates as managed by OpenSSL for instance, or with GNU PG. This ensures authenticity and integrity, uh, meaning that package signatures do not actually help with finding or fixing or mitigating flaws in packages. It's more about when you download a package, uh, you will know it has not been altered on its way, so it's safe to actually download it over HTTP or FTP, as long as the checksum algorithms are not broken. And then you can be sure that it was actually built by the person who owns the key, if the key was not leaked. Uh, Joyent has enabled signatures in production in 2014, and uh, in package source upstream, we still have kind of a difficult situation right now. We cannot easily do this. I will uh, mention why. Um, on one hand, uh, we could rely on X509, but it is quite complex, involves setting up PKI, and then there is GNUPG is a lot easier, but still you need to determine how to uh, ship the key, which policy should apply to the key. But there are also um, a number of other technical issues with uh, GNUPG on NetBSD. In particular, we have a chicken and egg problem because GNUPG is not available in base. So how do you install a package which is supposed to check its own signature? That doesn't work. So instead, I've been trying to add support uh, for NetPGP, which is another implementation of uh, GNUPG in base, uh, available in base in NetBSD. Uh, I wrote a command line wrapper, which takes the GNUPG syntax and adapts it for NetPGP instead, so I called it GPG to NetPGP. Uh, this still requires a few patches. Um, I imported a lot of them uh, recently in NetPGP, but there are still some issues. This is not enough still. For instance, there is a security issue remaining with detached uh, signatures with, with NetPGP that we have to fix. So this is still a work in progress. Um, however, if you want to test it out for yourself, you can first uh, generate a key with uh, GNUPG or with NetPGP. This is how you would do it. Then in mech.conf, you should uh, enable sign packages and mention GPG. And then for the individual tools to know uh, how to call uh, GPG, you can set it and force it to a specific implementation. And if you want to try things with NetPGP, you would use my wrapper, for instance, uh, changing it here. You can specify, of course, a particular key to use if you have multiple ones uh, on your system. And you can also specify key rings if you want to separate things even, even further. Then you just use package source uh, from source uh, normally to generate uh, assigned packages. Uh, we'll show this in an instant, but uh, when it comes to installing signed packages, um, you have, of course, to import the public key of the user who had, which was building the packages. You can use GPG for that if you already have it, or NetPGP should also work. Uh, this is simply done with GPG minus minus import, then you just pipe the key on the, on the standard input, for instance. Um, you can configure, uh, as I mentioned, um, a lot like with vulnerabilities, you can enforce signatures to be enforced on packages using uh, in package install.conf the verified installation parameter. And then you can use package source normally, this time from uh, binaries. 
and it will tell you when you install packages that the signature uh, is there and if it's valid or not. It will even like, at the moment uh, give you the, the fingerprint. We could probably make this uh, silent, but right now this is how uh, you can confirm that the package was actually signed and validated. All right, now moving on to a different mechanism, SSP for Stack Smashing Protection. This technology was initially introduced by IBM, then picked up by OpenBSD. It can actually find bugs in programs since instead of uh, silently corrupting your memory, which is what attackers use to subvert your programs, the, pro the, the program itself will detect that it was altered uh, when returning from functions, checking a canary value in the stack, and then crash. Uh, this implies a different uh, memory layout if you want it to be very efficient because you want your buffers in case of overflow to um, overwrite the canary value as soon as possible, as close as possible, so that even enough by one will actually trigger a, uh, a crash instead of corrupting memory. Uh, there is a slight performance penalty uh, associated with this uh, measure. I would say between 1% and 5%, depending on the settings and the program that you use. And unfortunately, this is not perfect. This is just a mitigation. It will not fix and magically uh, block every bug and every exploit. It can be defeated, for instance, through memory leaks if the attacker discovers the canary value because there is a arbitrary read somewhere, for instance, and the stack address is known, then this can be defeated. Uh, we support it on NetBSD on almost every architecture. In package source, I have added the support also for Linux x86 and FreeBSD x86 simply because I, didn't, uh, I couldn't test it uh, somewhere else. But it should be really easy to, to add support for further systems and architectures. It's just a matter of testing it and making, making sure sorry, that GCC supports it effectively over there. In make.conf, it can be enabled systematically for the whole system. Of course, this applies only when building packages, not when installing binaries. Uh, in this case, this is package source use SSP, which you can set to yes, or to all, or to strong. Uh, the difference this makes is that if you set yes, it will set a compilation flag uh, in the case of GCC and Clang minus F stack protector, but this will only protect some functions. The, the one functions where uh, the compiler sees there is a buffer in this function, and it's actually relevant to put a canary value. Uh, in some other cases, it's actually useless uh, or apparently useless to put canary values. You can, however, enforce it using uh, all instead of yes, so that every function is actually covered with a canary and protected by SSP. Or you can use a patch from Google, uh, which, uses, uh, which is then uh, used by Strong. The patch applies to GCC, so you have to rebuild GCC to, to import that. So uh, logically, this requires the package uh, that you're trying to build to support C flags, since this is added to the C flags automatically by uh, package source. Thankfully, more and more packages now support C flags. We've been focusing on that in the past few months. And um, uh, as a corollary, this only protects C, C++ programs or interpreters written in C or C++. And in particular, just-in-time compilation is not protected, since this is then code that's generated and run, uh, executed at runtime. Uh, it has nothing to do with the compiler, and if, it's, uh, if it wants to protect its own stack, it has to implement it itself. So this is not perfectly covering every situation. Uh, you can make it stronger, as mentioned, with F stack protector all, or with the patch from Google with strong. Um, we can add support for more compilers and platforms, so feel free to check on your own platform uh, package source, and if you uh, can add um, the bit of glue to enable your system to use SSP. If you want to validate and check, be sure that SSP was actually applied when building your packages, you can uh, check the binaries built, for instance with NM listing the symbols present inside the binary, and if you see underscore underscore stack check fail or, or stack check guard, you can be fairly sure at least one part of the binary was built using SSP. It will not definitively say, uh, definitely say that all of the binary was built this way, but usually it, it should apply everywhere. This has been enabled by default in OpenBSD since 2003 in their own ports. 
also in Fedora and Ubuntu since 2006, Dragonfly 2013, and now also package source. As of the coming release, that's Rana and Freeze, we have enabled SSP by default uh, where supported. So I'm quite excited about this. This is great. And as a companion technology to SSP, we also support Fortify. Uh, it's a bit different um, in the sense that it will, uh, this time, change calls to specific functions. So if, you, if the code uses unsafe, notoriously unsafe functions from the libc, for instance, sprintf or stringcat or memmove, the compiler will automatically replace these calls when it has knowledge of the size of the buffer with safer versions. So in this case, this uh, completely mitigates some buffer overflows, the ones which will actually use these uh, functions, but it involves support from the libc through the system headers in particular, which have to be reflecting the compiler you use. Uh, in this case, the performance impact is relatively neg negligible. The one difference it will make is that it will actually check the size of the buffer. So that's typically just one check. And again, the program will crash instead of suddenly corrupting your memory and allowing hackers maybe to execute unfriendly code, to say the least. So in package source, uh, we support it using package source use Fortify, which can be set to yes or to weak. We support it right now on Linux and NetBSD with GCC. In practice, this sets uh, a pre-processing flag or source through the C flags, uh, which is uh, Fortify source equals two in the case of yes. This requires again the package to support C flags. So we have the same limitation as, the, as with SSP. However, as of today, this is uh, the case for most packages. Maybe not absolutely all of them, but again, this protects only uh, C, C++ programs and interpreters. Just system compilation will not be protected. And um, additionally, there is uh, something else that's quite tricky with Fortify. It requires um, the uh, compiler, the, the, the flags, to be set to an optimization level of one or more. This is because compiling the binary in this case will be slightly different from the source code. So the user has to agree that this will happen, that something will be optimized. Um, so it's entirely possible that even though you're compiling with 45 source equals two, 45 will not actually be applied. We can, of course, add support for more compilers and platforms and to check that it works on your platform. Again, there is a way using symbols, very uh, helpful. With NM again, from Binutils, you can check if the symbol, for instance, sprintf check is uh, used by the program, uh, in this case, specific to GCC or NetBSD. Uh, but you can look for similar functions and it will uh, tell that Fortify was used at least in, in one place. And this has been enabled in default in uh, Ubuntu Linux for a, a good while, in Android maybe even from the beginning, uh, and in package source since the coming release. Uh, 2017. This is also now enabled by default. Um, very similarly to SSP this time, uh, stack check, which generates code to verify the boundary of the stack. It's a lot less relevant in production or globally for every package since, at least according to the manual page for GCC, this is only really useful for multi-threaded code. It involves support from the compiler. Um, this is not in package source yet, but I have an external patch in HPSD, which implements that. We could consider combining it with the build link, build, build link uh, definition for pthread, since it's a good hint that there is a multi-threaded code inside the current package. Um, and so we should not really apply it to every binary in, in the system. Uh, it sets this compilation flag in the case of GCC, and so again, we need to support C flags to actually implement that. Um, stack check doesn't work on every compiler. I do not know at this point if Clang supports it. Uh, it apparently applies for multi-threaded applications only. I mentioned that. I do not know how to validate if this mitigation is effectively in use. And we should also investigate if it is relevant uh, by default, uh, if at all. All right, now moving on. Uh, to Pi. I know we just had dessert, but this is not related. Uh, this means actually position independent executable, and it is a companion to the PAX ASLR uh, mechanism from the kernel. In more and more kernels nowadays, 
Uh, there is support for randomizing the address space for processes in userland and a uh, necessary mechanism uh, regarding binaries to uh, take the most advantage of that is to build position independent executables so that they can actually be placed in arbitrary positions in memory and therefore make exploitation more difficult because then the hacker needs to know at which offset will be which code. There are mechanisms uh, for hackers to, to uh, work around that but they are more complex to use usually. So in this case, it's a bit different from what I just mentioned because it involves not only the compilation phase, but also the linking phase. So let's have a look at uh, how this is enabled in package source. Using package source make pi, set, set to yes. In this case, it's just yes or no. And it will first set a compilation flag, minus fpick. And it also needs an LD flag uh, for linking time. Uh, however, there is a caveat in this case since this compilation, I mean this linking phase, must be completed with minus pi, but only for executables and not for libraries. Otherwise, it will just not build. This is implemented right now in the GCC wrapper in package source, so we can easily uh, walk around limitations in, in LD flags because we can tell in the wrapper if we're building a library shared object or a, an executable. And also, as of the current release of like, package source, this is supported in C wrappers, the new way introduced by Yorg recently to gain performance, among other things, when building package source. Uh, there are advantages actually to Py also, since packages not compiled with the appropriate C flags will fail to build, since the wrapper will uh, always enforce uh, minus Py to be used, and Py will not uh, build if the package was not, I mean, if the objects were not built with minus fpick. The package will not build if the mechanism is actually not enforced, implemented. So this reveals which packages are not implementing C flags or LD flags right away, which is great. So if you want to test across the entire tree, you can simply enable makepy and see what breaks. Uh, this can be combined with uh, pax control for the few binaries which actually crash uh, right now, legitimately when using ASLR and protect, we're trying to, to fix that. But in the meantime, you can use in the package definitions not packs SLR safe and not packs and protect safe. Uh, these two variables expect file names, the path to the executable files. And if you're interested in, in uh, fixing some packages in this regard, you can check this uh, file from the package source framework for more details on how to use that. To validate uh, if Pi was actually in use, you can do it at um, after building the package anyway using file, uh, which will tell you even for executables that you actually built a shared object. It's a bit weird, but it works anyway as an executable, and it will tell you, okay, uh, this is very likely to have been built with Pi enabled. Okay, now uh, one of the last mechanisms that are readily available in, in package source, in my list at least, Red row, which will protect elf executable programs. It's specific to this um, to this specification right now, and it will prevent hackers to tamper with relocations at runtime. So, if hackers can arbitrarily write uh, different values in the lookup table for procedures in at runtime, they can actually use jump tables to execute code outside of the normal perimeter. Uh, but this can be prevented since uh, a program can be started now with uh, bind now and red row so that before running any code, it will relocate everything as, it, as required, look up, looking up every symbol that can potentially be used, and then making this page with these joint tables read-only so that they cannot be altered by attackers anymore. So there is a performance penalty when starting big programs, but only when the program is uh, starting. After that, it, it can actually be faster since every symbol is already looked up. This involves the linking phase only. In the case of GCC, this will uh, be done using the railroad and uh, now uh, flags, LT flags. So therefore forwarded to the linker. Uh, in, in package source, this will be enabled using uh, railroad equals yes. Package source use railroad. It can also be set to partial, in which case only railroad will be set and not now which means basically that the uh, symbols are not uh, all uh, relocated when starting the program, not right away, if I'm correct. 
Uh, this requires the package to support LD flags. I just mentioned that. And there are still a few challenges with uh, Railroad and by now, right now specifically for Xorg. Because of the way some programs implement plugins, they may load drivers as shared objects, which then in turn declare which dependencies they have for the symbols that they use. And then asking Xorg to load the subsequent drivers implementing that. And unfortunately, since symbols are looked up right away, like also when loading shared objects, the program will crash because the symbol doesn't exist, it doesn't find it, and it, it, it breaks. So right now, Xorg has to be built using partial railroad and doesn't support uh, full railroad. Uh, this could be adapted to more platforms, however, not considering the issue with Xorg. Uh, the support I, I put in place only works on NetBSD, I think. It should be easy to uh, also adapt it for OpenBSD and Linux. But again, this requires support from packages to actually implement C flags, uh, no, LD flags this time. Uh, we can confirm that the binary was built with railroad and by now. This time it's very definite. We use opsdump to list the different sections uh, in the elf binary. And if there is a, a section called by now, which is actually a dummy value, the linker will see that and uh, apply railroad immediately. And otherwise, uh, the relocation table will be also pre uh, prepared uh, under the name railroad in the program header. Uh, this verification is now automated in package source. I implemented a, uh, a check using the, an awk script. This was my first awk program, actually. <laughs> and uh, this is enabled if you enable package developer, which will then automatically enable the number of checks when you build packages and then run the railroad check. In HPSD, I also created a small package just in, uh, uh, to, to verify that everything is fine. So it's a program which does nothing but links to a library. And then it runs uh, itself. It can tell you, um, as per the library code, if it was built with fpick. It can tell you then, as part of the executable code, using the library, if it was also built with fpick. Uh, it can be improved further by using FPI, but this is not strictly necessary. Programs can also tell if they were built with Fortify source, since the preprocessor will uh, uh, present the macro to them. And then I have also even an additional check for MMAP, in which case uh, we do still do not implement uh, the security of MMAP as good as it could be, as well as it could be, but uh, this is also being worked on. Now, um, let's spread the demo gods for, for the demo. Well, the good news is that I don't have to, because this, w this is a demo. My system is running right now on binary build of package source with all of that enabled, except maybe a uh, safe stack. Uh, so my user land has every feature mentioned uh, so far, except for Xorg with partial railroad, and even LibreOffice was built on my system here on this laptop using uh, Pi, Fortify, SSP, and it works fine. And I can slide, I, I can s swap slides. Okay, it's not super fast right now, but you can blame LibreOffice for that. It's, it's not me. <laughs> All right, now for what's left to do. Um, I haven't reviewed uh, this part of my, my, my talk as much as I should have. I, I gave this talk already actually at Azure BizDecon and BizDecon this year. And before that, there was also a reproducible build summit where I was introduced to this community. It's a very nice community. Right now, I encode a lot in Debian, but what they actually try to achieve uh, is a set of software develop development practice which create a verifiable path from human readable source to the binary code generated. So what this means, in other words, is that if you have a given source and a given system to build it, you want to be sure that it will actually compile to the same binary, like bit, uh, bitwise, you can compare bitwise the binaries you generated and it, they will be the same. This is in the purpose of verifying your compilation chain. If you want to be sure that everybody has the same compilation chain and that no one else fooled your compiler to uh, make your code generate something else, um, then you can verify against uh, binaries built by other people if you could uh, generate the same package. This involves uh, many changes in, in the, 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 the toolchain and also inside the source code of the packages. 
uh, you have to make sure that, for instance, the test suites will not be present inside the final um, binaries if they include the current data, date and time or build uh, number. Uh, this is also uh, relevant for about dialogues when people like to put in place which toolchain was used and what, uh, at what time the system was, uh, the, the package was built. This needs to be removed because we need to have the same binary everywhere. Or we need to use the same timestamps. I mean, there are a number of implications. So basically, we want to reach a deterministic build system. Uh, this doesn't bring security right away, but it allows you to check that your toolchain is actually correct or that you share it with everybody else. OpenBSD does that in a sense that they only support their own binaries. They do not support packages that you may have built on your site because when they get bug reports, they want everybody to be using the same binary to um, restrict the number of um, uh, invariants to the, the what everybody can actually verify. All right, so then with that, users can reproduce and verify what they build. Uh, this is already implemented in FreeBSD sports. It doesn't work yet across every uh, package of that tree, but uh, we could also try to achieve that in, in package source. Uh, this is already the case for the base system in NBSD, but we do not have it yet in, in package source. Uh, some things are actually very easy to, to get built reproducibly just by setting an environment variable, source data epoch. And some flags may also be relevant for GCC, for instance, when um, importing debugging symbols, for instance. Uh, they typically include the absolute path to the, the source code where it was built, but this can be replaced with debug prefix map, for instance, and, and so on. There's a number of ways to alter that so that everybody has the same uh, binaries eventually. All right, then there is also code flow integrity, uh, CFI, which prevents exploits from redirect redirecting the execution flow of programs. I'm not gonna have it off the top of my head to explain it in other words, but basically, again, you get control crashes instead of undefined behavior that can be exploited. Package source would be a, a great test bed for this feature since we can uh, take care of thousands and thousands of uh, packages at, at once through the, through the framework. This is available right now in Clang, which we support. Uh, and it involves uh, C flags, typically FL2 and sanitize equals CFI. Uh, there's a number of different uh, schemes which can be selected. Uh, possibly you can add visibility hidden. I do not remember the details uh, right now, but uh, basically it has a negligible performance impact, which means that it can even be suitable for release builds and bring an extra level of security when using Clang. With Clang again, you can enable safe stack, which is maybe even more interesting than uh, CFI right now. Um, this is the definition from the Clang website. It involves uh, C flags, F sanitize uh, set to safe stack. And if I remember right, it will divide the stack in two different stacks actually, yes the safe and the unsafe, uh, the safe stack has uh, the, the code flow, so it will store the return addresses, uh, local variables that are always accessed in a safe way, while the unsafe stack stores everything else, what can be corrupted and will not have an impact, for instance, on the execution flow. Uh, so then if it's overwritten, it's uh, less drama than if it would be the uh, return address. Okay, then in GCC, we also have some mechanisms that we can apply. Uh, through the C flags, the address sanitizer, F sanitize is set to address. It will detect out of bounds, use or use after free uh, by instrumenting memory access instructions. Uh, it's documented on the official GCC website. However, it has a huge performance impact and it's not always suitable for uh, production binaries. It can be used, however, for fuzzers uh, if you first code it, this is very useful and it will uh, very easily detect invalid memory accesses even without using libc functions and, and so on at the instruction level. All right, since time is also slowly running out, uh, I will conclude by saying that package source is a great project for testing security features. You can implement it uh, once through the framework and then it will be applied across the entire tree and since we support so many different packages, so many different packages are available, this can be applied to an entire distribution at once. Some mechanisms are uh, enabled by default now. 
among the ones that I just mentioned, particularly SSP and Fortify. I hope we can get also Pi or Relro soon. A lot more can still be done. Uh, I will welcome you to uh, have a look at the uh, features I just mentioned or even further ones if you feel like it. Uh, my own current focus is on testing full Relro, getting uh, Pi to work, working again on package signatures and implementing additional checks in package developer. Of course, you can beat me to it, please. <laughs> so that my to-do list reduces magically, that's great, I love that. And otherwise, I can only uh, thank you for listening so far uh, to your BizDecon for having me, to Package Source Project, Joyant for helping out Skyline, also really helpful with the HPSD project, to different communities which support me, providing shares and otherwise uh, bits of knowledge, and I'm available at netbusy.org, Corbin. So thank you very much. <laughs> if you have any questions, I will be happy to go ahead. Yeah, we have one, two, three. So Mark. Well, actually, I have... Uh Lots of questions, but I will limit myself to three of them. Okay. Uh, the first one is probably very simple about Fortify, like uh, you're using it for, system, for calls like memmove, which is usually a built-in in compilers. How does it fare with respect to that? It's always going to emit a memmove check, or is it still going to be able to do some built-in work? So what happens is that the libc headers um, are automatically re redirected if Fortify source is uh, set to one or two to a different one which will, uh, through a macro, change the call to memmove to something else like memmove check. And then um, this will only be done, for instance, if GCC is also in, in use, did, checking this macro. And then it will use attributes uh, to talk to GCC and tell it to change which uh, call to use. Okay, so then you yeah. use the built-in actually. Sorry? You lose the built-in. You lose the built-in. Uh, it, it's also a built-in from GCC. It just has a different name. Yeah, and but uh, yeah. for instance, the fact that uh, it can be optimized to inline code, uh, you lose that completely. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, probably, possibly yes, but I think GCC is smart enough to also inline the uh, memo version with the boundary check if it has GCC to. GCC is smart enough? Okay. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, two more questions, I'm sorry. Second yeah. one. Um, you're aware that uh, we have a way to work around the bind now issue. Like uh, we have a system call which is called, I think, kbind, which has the peculiarity that it can only be called from one address in a process space, mm -hmm. and we use that in our dynamic lint curl. So we can still have uh, uh, lazy binding and yeah. uh, still have uh, almost as strong as strong uh, rel arrow as you have, actually. Okay. You might want to look at that, probably, if you uh, haven't already. I think uh, we got the rel mostly from the uh, tool chain because this involves the dynamic loader, and the okay, dynamic loader is from is us. But you need support from the OS because it, there yeah. are parts in the kernel, but uh, um, otherwise, uh, uh, by now, it's uh, impractical for stuff like uh, LibreOffice if you still want to have any kind of performance. So that might be useful for you as well. Okay. Well, I didn't notice any specific uh, okay. issue with LibreOffice. I also have a modern laptop, quite recent, mm -hmm. so this could also be the reason. And uh, last question is a yeah. bit controversial. I okay. think that you've got lots of uh, options to make things more secure. Yeah. And I'm still wondering. Uh, why don't you turn them on by default? Like for instance, uh, wh why do you even have uh, to say that you want to have a signed vulnerability uh, database uh, package instead of uh, having it uh, check the signature by default and always have the most recent version unless you specif specifically ask otherwise and stuff like that? So actually, what I, a lot of what I described is already enabled by default. Ah, cool. Um, so the package vulnerability database, I don't think it's downloaded automatically every day, mm -hmm. but the signatures are verified by default. Um, then now in package source, we have SSP and Fortify enabled by default. Okay. Uh, I did actually this talk to uh, push for it because a year ago it was not in place and I did it, explained it, and I had to go around the world to convince everybody that this is okay. Right. <laughs> but and, uh, it was also a great experience and I, I keep pushing. 
and there's a small second part of that question, like for signatures, you only showed us what you do when you add one single package and you show the full signature. Yeah. If you add a list of packages and they all have the same signature, I assume that you're only going to show the information once, right? Uh, no, the information is displayed for each and every package that you install. That's something that you can fix and that will greatly reduce the number of information displayed. Okay. Should be easy. Thank you. Yeah, um, Benny maybe or? You said that address sanitizer is too slow to, for a production build. Um, yes, you wouldn't want to use it um, for the thing you, your users install. But, uh, but one, one way you could use it in a sensible way perhaps would be to provide a, pack, uh, a target that would build the, the package with ASAN turned on and then run the regression tests. Yeah. Like a make test dash ASAN or something. Yeah, this would be great. I do not know if we have the notion of does a package have a regression test uh, yeah. in package source yet in the framework, but if we could do that, mm -hmm. that would be great, of course. Well, you don't really need that. You can just, uh, what, what happens now if you do make tests and the package doesn't have tests, it just, you know, does nothing. Yeah. <laughs> But it also needs to be specified yeah. for each package, how to run the test, and yeah, true. it's quite a bit of work. And you can probably also do uh, TSAN at the same time, thread sanitizer. Yeah, yeah. An MSAN, memory sanitizer, yes. 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 Christosan. So I see that the, the security model you propose here is quite centralized, and mm -hmm. it's strongly relying uh, on the compiler. Yeah. Uh, if I look at the security nowadays, it tends to be really decentralized. There are like technologies like blockchain, for example, mm -hmm. who tends to decentralize things. So my question is, do you think that there would be like a better way to do it instead of relying only on the compiler? Well, a single really piece of software, which is like GCC in this case. It's not really that we rely on the compiler. I'm just using features offered by the compiler uh, in package source and enabling it for the entire range of, uh, of distribution. Uh, what the packages do in themselves isn't relevant to us. They, we are only a framework to build a distribution. Uh, security then is also a field which applies to everything. There is an, a security dimension to everything you do, even sitting on a chair. Someone has actually tested the chair to be safe, so that it doesn't break in pieces and cut your hand if, if it fails. So we cannot cover everything centrally or dis in, in a decentralized manner. Uh, it, this is highly context specific, and there is no magic wand to just secure everything, unfortunately. Hi, my question is uh, probably being asked, I'm not sure, because it was uh, slightly technical and I'm not a security okay. person, but um, uh, the, way, the same way that um, like we do testing with Anita on NetBSD, for example, where a bunch of test cases are done and there's an automated way to test, uh, I'm wondering if something like a pen testing tool like Kali or something could be run real time to continuously probe if our security. So again, instead of building the fort and not you know, assuming it'll work, is there a way to kind of continually throw whatever challenges or whatever known threats there are out there? So I'm just wondering if that's part of a broad design approach to this uh, infrastructure, if there's possibility for that. I think it should be possible to do a lot more in this direction. I do not have any specific idea on top of my head outside of what we just mentioned with fuzzing, maybe Christos. Yeah. So uh, Google has, is offering a great project. It's called OSS Fuzz, and basically you can submit your open source project, and they have a library API for fuzzing. So you, they will run your code, and they will actually open bug reports to you. Uh, they run, uh, you know, your code against, you know, arbitrary inputs uh, using both uh, all three sanitizers. I think both MSAN, UBSAN, and ASAN. And, uh, you know, this is a great way uh, to uh, get cheap cycles to run your functions against whatever you want. So if packages want to get more secure, uh, you know, they should just subscribe to that. And uh, actually there is also money back. Uh, you know, Google will pay you money uh, if, uh, you know, you, they, you advertise and you find bugs and you introduce uh, with their build. 
So that's a great plugin for Google, although I don't work for them. If you want to do it in package source, uh, since we have the framework, we can easily, uh, for each and every target, uh, build the system up to the package you want to test, and then build this one with ASAN, TSAN, UBSAN, and so on, and then run this test suite and easily script that through package source. Uh, Petra, maybe? I just wanted to comment that uh, it's probably not useful if um, um, a package source has um, tests for Firefox, if Firefox already does them th themselves. So it depends on the package if it makes sense to do this from package source or if the, uh, the project we are using um, is doing it themselves. Yeah, I think we should disable test suites by default when building in bulk, and but then tell package source how to actually run it if people want to have it. So uh, as I yeah. said, you can do like a I think a test target equals something, um, and yeah, it's not run as part of the build normally. Uh, except I think you can set a variable that will run it uh, yeah. after building. Absolutely. Um, the other thing, uh, Christos, you mentioned Google's offering. Um, I don't know if David Maxwell still does that, but there were the uh, security scans. What was the name of the company? Coverity. Coverity, right. Um, so so their, their approach, last time I looked at it, was your thing you want to test must be in package source, and they use that for building, uh, and then they test it with their static analyzer, which is normally a commercial, very expensive product, and they'll send you a report, and uh, you can look at all the bugs it has found, there's like dozens of them typically. Yeah, thanks Penny. Uh, is there anyone else who, yeah, over there? Uh, thanks a lot f uh, first. Um, I'm actually uh, not very familiar with NetBSD or uh, PKG source. Uh, so that was a great overwhelming introduction for me. Thank you. Um, I just cloned the repository and, uh, well, it was just about one gigabyte, so I'm very sorry for blocking uh, the network here. Um, and I was wondering why it's so huge. I had a look and uh, it seems like uh, all the ports were in there first and a lot of uh, stuff already. Uh, have you thought about splitting that up and just uh, offering, uh, w without the bootstrap table, but just the sources themselves? Uh, can someone else answer that? Because this is not where I'm the most familiar. So I'm going to give a half cynical answer. Um, <laughs> um, one gigabyte is not a lot of disk space. Uh, well, downloading one gigabyte is not nice, but uh, you could start it from the tar XZ, which is less than 30 megabytes. And I think it's relatively reasonable to be downloading 30 megabytes. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So should I conclude here? Okay.